Oh, wait, it's, it doesn't decline anymore. Um, yeah, so for today, I wanted to finish a bit on what we did last time and then go back to a data analysis task. Let's see where we start here. Maybe um, any questions or any points which people are interested straight from uh, what we uh, covered last time. Otherwise, what I thought what we could start with is, wait, this was last time. Here is, okay, sorry, I quickly have to find the right data. Don't save, don't save, file, uh, recent files lecture form. So, what I thought we'll start with today is we, uh, you realize the really important, the heart of the whole uh, testing thing is this concept of p-values to, to really hammer it in. I thought I quickly go through what we did last time and take another example of last time of Fisher's test. This time with a slightly different, uh, with a slightly different twist on it, but maybe you don't even notice the difference. Uh, what we have here is I took, um, I assume here that we have mice, and let's say we have uh, some drug which supposedly is a prophylactic against cancer, and we want to try it out, and so we take some mouse line which is known to have a predisposition to develop tumors, and we want to see, uh, we want to see uh, whether this mouse line uh, gets protected against its tumor. So let's imagine we have 20 mice, which either get normal chow or they get a chow which is uh, which is enriched with this supposedly prophylactic drug, and we have 20 mice total, and we let them live for an, for a year or so, and when we check them for tumors, and we can assume that it might look like this: that we have uh, that the 10 mice which got the control tumor, only uh, eight of them got cancer, and of those which got the drug, uh, four of them got them. So just from your gut feeling, do you think this is a good result? Would this be convincing to get uh, if the uh, incidence of cancer went down from 8 in 10 to 4 in 10? Does this mean that we have a prophylactic ability here? After all, these are 20 mice. This is a quite a reasonable sized experiment in the mind of many people. So let's see. Um, so to check whether this is, I quickly go through and I do it quickly now because you've seen it before. I've made this two by two contingency table where, uh, as I did last time, I used the R-bind function to put uh, these numbers together. And I only added this here so that it looks nicer that I have a labeling of my, uh, of my fields. And now, of course, I do a Fisher test. And as you can see, we get a p-value of 0 0.17, which is uh, not very significant. Now, uh, to understand what's going on and to remind you what a p-value is, let's quickly do this within simulation. Uh, my, uh, my null hypothesis is that this drug has no effect whatsoever. So if it has no effect whatsoever, then I shouldn't make a difference between control and drug, and I should simply add this up and say, for, of my 20 mice, 8 have gotten, uh, 12 have gotten tumors, and 8 haven't. So the probability to get a tumor is 12 in 20, so that's, six, that's 0.6. Um, let's use uh, R's Rune function, which just gives me, I quickly show you how this works. Um, the, the Rune function, that stands for random uniform. R always means get random numbers, and unif means get them uniformly from the area of 0 to 1. So if it uniformly takes numbers between 0 and 1, then of course half of them will be below 0.5 and half above, or 60% of them will be below 0.6. So this is a way to ask R to throw a loaded coin, which gives true with 60% probability and falls with 40. And on average, of course, which should be six trues, but not always. So uh, I now check how many, uh, how many trues I have here. So as you've seen before, I have my thing and I use here sum of has tumor to see how many trues there are and sum of not has tumor, you remember the exclamation mark means not, to see that we have uh, um, 
ready for four without tumor. So putting this together, this is now one row of our contingency table, and I do this twice. And now I have a contingency table with two rows, but both are thrown from the same idea because our null hypothesis is that there's no difference. So they're both produced in the same way. And as we discussed last time, whenever you want to make a test, you need a test statistic. A test statistic is a single number which summarizes the whole thing. And one thing that people like to use as a test statistic is something like the odds ratio. It works like this. If you're a control mouse, then your odds of getting a tumor is eight, is eight to two. We could say the probability here seems to be 80%. So 80% of the mice are tumor, but you also can, instead of saying, eight in 10 got the tumor, you can say eight got it, two didn't get it. And when we use this ratio, eight versus two, and that's what you call the odds that comes from uh, betting. And so it seems here in this contingency table that the odds of getting tumor for a control mice is eight against two, and the odds of getting, uh, of getting uh, tumors if you take a prophylactic drug is only six against four. So we have eight over two, that's four, and we have six against four, this is uh, one and a half. And we look at the ratio of these two odds. That's what you call the odds ratio, and you see this quite often in statistics. But we look at the odds under control condition and the odds under treatment condition, and then we take the odds ratio. So this here is the odds to get tumor. Yes, no. Yes, divided by no under the drug line and under the control line. And I look at the ratio of these odds. And in this case, the odds ratio is 0.375. So the odds of getting tumor seem to be lower with the drug than with control. Now, of course, you remember this year was the contingency table that I got from uh, taking my null model. So here we already see how low the odds can become just by chance. So what was the odds ratio in the original data? I take the same formula as I had before. Uh, here, let's write it a bit nicer. Control, yes, yes, divided by no, no. And I get here my odds ratio of 0.16. Now, how would I now get, um, how can I now get a null distribution to see what kind of odds values can actually happen? I do what I've done here. Remember, I calculated the, I made a control, a drug, then I made a contingency table from these random numbers, and then I calculated the odds ratio for them. And I can just take these four lines and this line here, put them all together. So here are these five lines. I've just copied them down from top to the bottom. And now I say replicate this 100,000 times. Let's put here an enter so that it looks a bit nicer. And if I replicate it 100,000 times, you can see it goes quite fast when I get here this histogram of the odds ratio. I can't see much in this histogram. That has two reasons. First, uh, the bins are much too wide. I, it here, it took by default, R always uses 30 bars for a histogram. Now I write, so I write here uh, comma um, x equals 100 to tell R that I want to have 100 bins and then I see it a bit more. But we have another problem. And the other problem is that odds, that in odds of one to two, or an odds ratio of one to two and an odds ratio of two to one is about the same, equally extreme. So uh, we should treat them on equal footing, but one is two, three, four, five, and is all the way to the right on this plot, and the other is one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, which is all smooth in in this small part. There is a general problem whenever you visualize uh, ratios. And if I now visualize take the logarithm of these ratios, then you can imagine this thing becomes symmetric. Uh, things like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, under a log 2, turn into, one, into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And something like a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, go on to minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. Hence, important sacred rule, whenever you visualize ratios or fact, whenever you visualize relations, plot them on a log scale. Plotting them on a log scale now looks like this. And you see, this is now nicely symmetric. And our upwards ratios are equal to the downwards ratios. Of course, this is now a log 2, so you have to remember that you take 2 to the power of these things to read them. So this is a ratio of 4 times higher odds with the drugs. So 2 times higher, 4 times higher, 8 times higher, 16 times higher. And here, half as much, quarter, 8, 16th. 
Uh, usually when I somehow co-author co on some biology paper and uh, people show me their figures, the first thing I always do is to launch into my standard lecture on change all your axes in logarithmic to put it to uh, show your um, uh, to show your plots. The worst that people do is this. They, they make a, a ratio like a fold change and then they say one, two, one, two, three, four, and then they say this is called fold. Uh, when we have one condition which regulates it two fold, three fold up, and another one which regulates it three fold down. This is a completely useless graph because if you make a bar chart, and in a bar chart everybody assumes that the bottom of the bar is somehow is zero. But the zero condition is a ratio of one to one, so no change. So first mistake, bar charts used for to depict something which doesn't start at zero. Second mistake, uh, non-logarithmic scale. Once I now change it into logarithmic scale, where I now label things like a uh, two-fold, four-fold, eight-fold, one half, one quarter, one eighth, and I can now simply say this year is no change, this year is change three fold up, and this year is change three fold down. So this just as a side note on how to properly uh, on how to properly uh, plot uh, ratios. You see the difference here. In essence. There is this idea that everything can be shown in a bar chart, so you always see the upper part in uh, papers, but it's simply wrong and misleading. Now, but here in our case now, you see uh, it's now our ratio of log two fold changes, and you see most of them are on zero, which means one to one, the same thing, and then they go down here and they go down here. Um, you, it seems a bit scattered, which is simply because. Uh, of course, we are working here with small numbers. It might be two against three mice, one against four mice, and every time the odds ratio makes a jump. So there's a bit an ugly histogram. But in any case, here's the value which I got in the original data of my actual mouse experiment, well, at least the one which I made up. And you can see this here are the null cases, which seem to be more extreme than what we've seen. If I want to, I can now decide on what I want to make a two-tailed test. Should I now take the ratio of these here against everything, or should I take the ratio of this left tail and here the right tail? Because maybe I don't know beforehand whether my drug uh, is prophylactic against cancer or actually aggregates the cancer risk. If my null hypothesis is simply that it doesn't change anything and that I would be surprised by both an aggravating or by a reduction in cancer load, um, then I should probably count any uh, odds ratio which goes either way, otherwise I count it only to the left. Here I've now counted either way, so I ask uh, how many of these log ratios, and I take the absolute value to always flip it to the right hand side, in this histogram are larger than the actual value. If I remove the apps, then I would only compare one end. And if I do this, then I get here this p-value of 0 0.061, which is about the same as we had. Uh, is it? No, it isn't because here, oh here I for 0 0.16. Ah, right, yes, it isn't. And last time when we did this, we noticed that it was pretty much the same. So what did we do differently? First, it's not a big deal. P-value of 0.16, P-value of 0.06, we really shouldn't, uh, we really shouldn't uh, worry too much about that. It's both not really significant and not very convincing. The reason why we see a difference is a subtle one. You remember how we introduced the Fisher's test last time with a lady tasting tea who got presented eight cups of tea and she knew beforehand that, she, that four of them has tea first, and you should point out the four cups which have tea first. So when we made our permutation, when we simulated our null distribution, we simulated the case where we always pick four of the eight. The uh, corresponding thing here would be that if we take this table, when we say of the 20 mice, eight of them have tumors, which of these eight got the drug and which didn't get, got, haven't got the drug. So this is what uh, Fisher's test assumes, that we take eight of 20 and that we only is allow, um, allow um, contingency tables where the sum of 
mice getting tumors is eight, the same way as the woman knew that she always has to pick four which have T first. And this is the assumption we do in the Fisher test, while in my simulation I just hasn't assumed this. I just took a random value with, um, why do I actually say eight, twelve? Yeah, 12 got tumors. I just took a random value which had a probability of 60% so that on average I have 12 tumors over the contingent tables, but I might also get tables where he, here I have 13 or 14 and here I, or I have 11 or 10. In practice, as you see, it does make a difference. Our p-value is 0 0.06 and it's not 0 0.16. Um, in theory, people argued in the literature actually for decades about what would be more appropriate to use, whether this is correct, that, Fischer's, that Fischer in his test uh, in, uh, puts in this condition that the marginal sums stay the same over all of them, or whether one should rather do it as I simulated it here. I had completely forgotten about this debate. I just wrote my simulation, noticed that I get a different result, and then I remembered this story, how people argued. Uh, uh, lots about it. In practice, however, if you need to resort to this kind of technical arguments in order to decide, is of course exactly what happens. We might have gotten a p-value of not 0.06, but of 0.04, and then the biologist would have argued with a statistician about, if you had used the other test, then we, uh, we could publish. Uh, obviously, we don't want that, but this is, sort, uh, this is sort of the minor things which sometimes can make quite a difference and sometimes not. So these tests, something like the Fisher test, has underlying assumptions, like in that case, that, any, that the null distribution only contains cases where the number of mice which gets tumor is not on average 60%, uh, but always exactly 60%, which may or may not be a... Uh, a uh, useful assumption for your test. In practice, one approach is to simply not care because experience tells that it doesn't make so much difference. The other possibility is to code a quick simulation, as I've just shown you, to figure out what, whether it actually makes a difference. So, what was the other thing? So far, um, what we always talked about was uh, discrete cases cases where we counted something, so and so many sixes, so and so many mice with tumors or um, coins with heads up or cups with tea first. But often you have continuous values. And to get to a current example of such a continuous value, what I now do is I execute this code here. Uh, maybe it looks intimidating to you. It shouldn't. It's simply a copy and paste from the code from the first lecture, which reads in this enhanced data. For those who've already forgotten, this is how the enhanced data looks like. We have all these uh, 10,000 people from the United States and with their age in 2012 or whenever it was, their sex, their height, their weight, their ethnicity, and whether they were born in the U.S. or not. And one thing that we noted a bit at the end of, a, of the first lecture was that if we filter this data down to only the adults, age greater 20, only, the ma only one sex, so that we don't conflate it, and take only one ethnicity, say the Mexican, to take an immigrant ethnicity, and then, uh, and then look at the heights, then we can factor by this extra factor here whether they are born in the U.S. and see something which looks quite like a difference. The Mexicans who were born in the U.S. are on average a bit taller than Mexicans who were not born in the U.S. So. If I'm careful statistician, I say not born in, in the U.S., and I don't say born in Mexico, even though this is probably the case for most of them, because who knows, maybe somebody identifies in Mexico even for only his grandparents from Mexico and he was born in completely else. But in general, we can say this is the difference between uh, people who self-identify as Mexicans and live in the U.S. and were either born in the U.S. or born in Mexico, and they and I call this now, so that I don't have to speak so long sentences, I call this group A and group B. Uh, the blue one is group A, the red one is group B, and I would claim that group B is a bit taller than group A. The first thing is these density plots. They are always a bit hard to read, and I think somebody mentioned to me last time that it would be helpful to explain a bit how actually these density plots are meant. But before I get to that, I do something much easier. I replace them with a B swarm plot. This year is a B-swarm plot. Every individual is related by a point. We don't average over individuals. We don't aggregate them. We show the full data. Every single data point is represented by a point here. 
and you can easily see uh, quite quickly how many are there who are really taller than the tallest uh, non-immigrant, maybe these 10. How many are smaller? There seems to be one outlier, but it's only a single outlier. Let's not count them. Uh, everybody clear why this is called a bee swarm plot? For those who aren't, because I, okay, you are all biologists, uh, but um, yeah, for those who haven't seen these pictures yet, how it looks like if a bee swarm escapes their nest and moves around on um, looking for a new place to build a new beehive. Let's not look at him, but this is how they usually look like, and somebody felt reminded of that. This is why we call these the bee swarm plots. This is a proper way of plotting it. What most people would actually do to plot this would uh, be, be to use a geom, uh, how is it called? Uh, is this geom's count? No. Yes. Right. Ah, no, I don't get it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, what most people usually would do is show a piece, a bar plot, just a single black bar with an error bar on top. <laughs> I think I explained last time why we don't like error bars. The other reason why you would, there's of course one good reason why you would prefer a bar plot over a bee swarm plot. The bee swarm plot shows your data, it makes you transparent. If you want to hide your outliers, you better don't show them. Hence, it would be very good for the quality of science if reviewers would insist on seeing bee swarm plots as whenever you have less than 100 counts, so uh, that, uh, that it just doesn't take too much space to put a few dots. So now um, we, uh, we could now ask, is this difference significant? By I, what, what people say, is this significant? I would say it is pretty significant. I quickly do this here. I use here these commands, you know, the same as again. I take the data, filter out, uh, the adults, which are male, which are Mexican, and which are born in the US, and where the height is, is not missing in the data, and I pull out only the height column and call this now height A, and for those which are not born in X, I call it height B. And now I make a t-test, height A, comma height B. You already know this, these things are always called Fisher test, binomial test, t-test, something test, and you give it always your data, and when it produces you this little table and gives you here a p-value, which looks quite significant. Now, what's going on inside the t-test? What does this thing actually do? To see this, let's first make an ex construct an example which has a, a, a bit more ambiguous value. So this is 10 to the minus 7. That's a very significant p-value. Let's go down to, uh, of course, if we had fewer people, then we would get a less clear value. So let's go down to only 50 people. So I sample 50 uh, uh, a group people and 50 B group people and make a t-test of them and this time my p-value as you see is only 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Let's see if we get there again. Uh, actually you might notice here it says Welsh to sample t-test but everybody knows students t-test. What's the difference between students and Welsh t-test? There's an extra argument, equal variance, because the question is, is the variance or standard deviation here and here the same or not? If we have so much data, it might be helpful to uh, estimate the variance for the two, uh, for the two B swarms separately, and this is why R by default estimates them separately and calculates with two variances. When student worked out the whole thing in the beginning, he estimated only one variance. He just took the average of the two variances which is a reasonable idea uh, and that's what I will now do also because it's easier to explain. So where am I now here? So uh, again what we need is a test statistic. Our test statistic the first time it was the number of cups that the woman got right then just back now it was the odds ratio now my last test statistic is uh, the t statistic where I take the, um, where I, uh, where I do the following. Obviously, a good, a good um, test statistic might be to take the mean of one sample and the mean of the other sample and take the difference of the mean. The bigger the difference, the uh, larger, the, uh, the clearer the whole, um, 
uh, with, uh, with significance. However, you already see if I just told you that the mean here is here on 172 and here it's on 168, you don't quite know yet whether this is significant because you wonder how precise is this mean. Can the mean actually, uh, did we measure the mean precisely to see such a small difference? And for this, we should also know the standard error of the mean. And the standard de error, as you remember, is something like the standard deviation divided by square root of n. So one thing we could do is that we divide, um, that we, uh, that we, s that we divide the means by the, uh, that we, sorry, that we calculate the standard error of the means and ask how many standard errors are these two things apart. And for this, we have to calculate the standard deviation. So this is what I've done here now is I calculate, where was it now? I calculate the standard deviation of one sample and of the other sample, and now I just take the average of the two, because the two standard deviations, they are about the same. You see this thing has standard deviation 6.8, this thing has standard deviation 6.5, so what should I take? Let's not worry too much about it. Let's take the average, and which is 6.7. Now while I'm presenting this, I suddenly realize that the textbook approach is to not take the this difference of a standard deviation, deviation but the difference, uh, the, not the average of the standard deviations, but the average of the variances. So I should square them, take the average, and then take the square root again. Maybe I fix this when I, yeah, let's do it properly. Square root, so just so that you see that it doesn't make, doesn't, it wouldn't really matter. So this is now the average standard deviation. If I take the average variance, which is just the square of a standard deviation, and then take the square root of that to get back to a standard deviation. What do I get? 6.71, same thing. Only if we had, re now we are, we are doing exactly what the textbook tells us. What the textbook also tells us that for this to be a, a t-statistic, I should divide by the standard error. And I should really do it. And the standard error is, we is divided by the number of samples which I use to estimate my mean, and this is 50 each. And um, but I won't do this now. I simply yeah, let's still call it t. And have I done this right here? Now because this will be always be the same value, whether I divide it by square root 50 or not, doesn't really matter. Now here we see how many standard deviations were apart from each other. And now I want to have a null distribution. So what I do is I take, I uh, set up first a null hypothesis. My null hypothesis is that in reality there is no difference between, yeah? Sorry, it's just that this one information is blocking what's coming next. Um, can you remind me again, please, what's the difference between a standard deviation and a variance? Uh, the standard, ah, right. This is simply the, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So, so for it's, yeah. it's again a measure of how yes. So you see, if I if uh, let's take the standard the standard deviation is just the spread here. How much this is spread out? We had a standard deviation of I think seven. So seven is about from 170 to 177. So from the mean upwards and to the mean downwards, this is the standard deviation, this area, which contains about two thirds of the data. That's what we call the standard deviation. And for technical reason, into which we might get at some of the, of the next lectures when we talk about what actually a normal distribution really is, uh, we, uh, we always first calculate the variance and then take the square root of that and then get the standard deviation. And because the variance is the intermediate thing and there's some, uh, some technical reason why it's more appropriate to make, make the mean on the variance uh, to first average and then take the square root when the other way around. So, but now we have this. Next thing is, uh, yeah, but do feel free to ask such questions. That's always good. Um, now, now I, where was I here? Now I want to set up a null hypothesis. And my null hypothesis is that in reality, there is no difference between group A and group B. In reality, all these values, sorry, not in reality, but in my null reality, 
all these values are taken from the same distribution. And this same distribution has one mean and one standard deviation. So they are all taken from a, from a um, from a standard from a normal distribution which has a mean somewhere here, and which has a standard deviation somewhere about that. So I need a null distribution. For this now I get a null mean and a null standard deviation. What should I take as a null mean? I just assume that in reality both the group A and the group B have a very same average and as an estimate for what this average might be, I take of course simply the average taken over all of them, ignoring which group they are from. Now because my groups are both the same size, I can simply write this as taking the average of the two means. And here I have taken the average of these two standard deviations. I wanted to make it the average of, of the two variances actually. And square root. So. And now I have I have here done something which simply looks like an average over both of them. And now that I have this, I can ask R to give me samples from this hypothetical null standard deviation. So if it were true that there's no difference between the groups, then no matter which group it has, it should be values which look like this. Normally distributed with this mean mu zero. Maybe I should write them. Mu zero and SD zero. Normally distributed with mu mean 168 and standard deviation 6.7. And if I use this, then you see I get such values here. And for each of these values, I can calculate a test statistic. So what I now do is I take, uh, I just take 50 such values. Now this would be one sample of 50 people from group A and I calculate the test statistic in the same as we did before. We now take the, the mean of them and the standard deviation, divide them by each other and say, okay, this is my T. So remember how we calculated our true test statistic here, mean of one group, mean of the other group, divided by, uh, by the average variance of the two group, average standard deviation of the two groups. And I do this here. I get one sample, another sample from the same distribution, but even though they are from the same distribution, of course, they don't have the same mean. One might be slightly slower than the other, and I divide them by the standard deviation, and then I get it, get a t value. And I do this again and again and again, and every time I get a different t value, and now I get feelings of how, what kind of t values people might expect if our null hypothesis were true. If our null hypothesis were true, then typically these t values shouldn't, dis, uh, shouldn't deviate from zero much more than this here. To get a good feeling how far t values would deviate from the zero, I ask R to come to do this, uh, this example 100,000 times. It's no, it was a bit faster, but it's done. Now I can make a histogram here. And here is the histogram of these T values. What was our, what was our <coughs> real T value? I should make a line in here to show the, our real T value. So T was the real value. Uh, comma cal is green. This is the real t value here. You see it's so far out that we can now see the probability of getting a value as extreme as that one is probably is uh, the integral of the sum of these small probabilities down here or the ratio of values down here against all values. So of our 10,000 values how many are to the left of this green line and again I should probably just tau comma ltypsilon is dashed. If I go in into my analysis with, now, with no prior assumption about whether now the foreign born or the US born Mexicans are the taller ones, whether being born in the US makes you taller or shorter, I should probably say I would be I would be equally surprised or I would be equally inclined to reject my null hypothesis if I get a t value which is not below the left line but above the right line. So probably in order to get the, to answer the question how probable it is to, that our null value produces a t value as we got it or something more extreme, 
we should add up all these numbers here and all those numbers. So how many of them are there? How many of them are either smaller than when we left or larger than the right? A convenient way to answer both of these questions in one go is to use this ups function, which just removes the signs. It leaves absolute value of three. Is let me show you how this works. If I say apps of three, it doesn't do anything. And if I say apps of minus three, it makes it three. So it removes all minus signs. And then, of course, everything will be flipped to the right on this axis, and this will give you the John, and this will simply now answer the question, what is outside the two green lines? So how many of them are outside the two green lines? Let's first use the table command to ask how many are outside 49 of 100,000. And if I use mean, then it, it does the extra step for me of dividing it. And we see that our p-value is 0 0.00049 because 49 values are outside the green line of 100,000. Let's go back to our original t-test up here. What did we get? 0 0.00478 which is quite good. So this time I really correctly reconstructed the internal assumption that the t-test does. And now we have something which is a nice t-value. So uh, questions about that. So now you see what the t-value, what the t-test really does. It assumes that your two groups are actually the same group, hence they have a common mean with a common standard deviation, which it just gets by averaging. If your two groups have different size, maybe I have much more samples from one group than the other group, then it will take these averages in a, in a suitably weighted fashion. Uh, but in the end, this is what we do. And then we simply ask how probable it is according to the normal distribution to get out there. Uh, or not according to this t distribution to get out there. This thing here, by the way, is not a normal distribution. It's a t distribution. The reason why it is not a normal distribution is because we took the normal distribution, sampled from it, when we calculated an estimate of a standard deviation and divided by that. And if you <coughs> if you estimate if you estimate a mean and you estimate a standard deviation, both from normal samples, and you divide them when you're no longer normally distributed. What actually happens is that your tails get fatter. So there's more thing out there, which means weak uh, extreme values become more likely when the normal distribution takes it. Here for, four, for 50 samples, it doesn't make a lot of a difference, but if you have only five or 10, it does make a lot of difference. You might remember from my first lecture that I told you that error bars from the sta standard error of a mean value tend to usually be too small. If you have few samples, that's exactly this effect, that uh, the tails of a T distribution are fatter, which takes into account that it happens quite easily to underestimate the standard deviation and hence I uh, think your data is more precise than it is. Next thing that I wanted to do is now go away from p-values and show you a different kind of test where you don't talk about p-values which looks much more natural and in retrospect maybe it would have been easier to start with that one. Let's say we have a lab test. You are a doctor, a medical doctor and you have you are uh, suggested to use a new lab test on your patients to screen them for some dangerous disease and this lab test has uh, is is advertised by the company of having amazing sensitivity of 98 percent sensitivity is defined as follows if a patient has the disease the test will give a positive result with 98 percent probability the other number that the manufacturer doesn't like so much to tell is the specificity. If a test does not have a disease, the test will give a negative result with 90% of probability. But for 10% of the cases where the patient does not have a disease, um, the, uh, the test will give a positive result. Now, if the doctors ask about it, the pharma rep will tell them, yeah, but don't worry about it. 90% is pretty good. And if 10% of the people who don't have it uh, still get it, then better safe than sorry. The important thing is that you catch the disease if it's there. And this is a dramatically wrong statement. And it's something which appears all the time because one typical case is you might know that there's now all this debate about cancer screenings, pap smears, and so on. And certain tests are only 
advertised for women above the age of 50 or men above the age of 45 or something like that. Why would this matter? Why would we advise people who have an who are below a certain age to not even take a test? Wouldn't it be better to always take a test just to be better safe than sorry? Uh, so let's take this example. Let's imagine that your test is positive. You went to the doctor, he administered the test, the test is positive. Should you be worried? And now I will do a now uh, there's two ways to do this calculation. One would be to talk about Bayes' theorem, and Bayes' theorem is actually something which always gets me confused every time I try to explain it. And when I try, try to explain it without mentioning Bayes' theorem, it can becomes remarkably simple. So, because the crucial point is, as most of those of you who know this thing, and actually everybody is supposed to know this thing, but. Uh, they made some kind of survey asking doctors whether they have heard about this case, and most doctors got it wrong, which is a bit worrying. Um, let's say that this test is administered to 10,000 patients, and 1% 1 of them, so 100 of these 10,000, actually have the disease. So the prevalence of this disease is 1%. Actually, there is a little caveat here. I say it's a prevalence because but who knows, at least the prevalence among those people who report to the doctor to get the test taken, which is an important caveat, but we come to this later. Um, if 1% have a disease, then we can now here start thinking about it. Of the 100 patients which have a disease, 98 are expected to get a positive result, and for two of them the test will fail and they have a negative result. And of the 90,900, healthy subjects, so the remainder, 90% of them will get a negative result, as they should, this is 8, 9, 10, but 10% 10 will get a positive result, and that's 990. So we have a total, I've done the math before, so that I don't have to embarrass myself now trying to calculate in my head, we have 1,088 subjects with a positive result, and of these 1,088 subjects, so 8, 9, 10, and uh, sorry, 990 plus 98, and only 9%, namely the 98 which I have here, actually have the disease. So that means before you did the test, you knew that your risk of having this disease is 1% because that's the prevalence in the general population. Now you're among the subpopulation where the test is positive, and now you know your disease, your risk is 9%. This now means that you should be worried, and this is exactly what, what all the health officials are worried. If they, if they um, suggest that the test is done for people below in an age group where the disease is still rare, when you have thousands of people who suddenly now know that the risk of having the disease is low, but not as low as we thought before, and where they say, should you treat me, but it's 99%, you have no clue what to do with that. They are, it's definitely still too low to, just, to justify cutting open the patient to check whether there's any tumor. So this, is, this whole exercise is something what we call base, uh, what we call base theorem. Base theorem is what we now do here is, um, let's quickly write this, base theorem is a mathematical way to capture such thing. And for this, we define events. I define D, subject has the disease, subject H, subject is healthy, healthy, uh, P, test result is positive, and N, test result is negative. And now, probability, and now I can, for example, take my sensitivity, which I said before is the probability of getting a positive result if we use it on a patient who, is, uh, who has the disease. So this is a so-called conditional probability, and we always write it as the event for which we want the probability and the condition with which we already say that it has occurred. Specificity is a probability that the patient, uh, that we get a negative result if a patient doesn't have a disease, and prevalence is the probability that the patient has the disease. 
and what we will now want to do want to get is we we want the probability if we see a positive the probability that the patient has the disease if we see a positive result that's what we just calculated that's the thing which is now nine percent and to get this uh, and to get this if you now look at the math that we've just done and put all and re replace all the numbers that i've just done with uh, the values then uh, you get to uh, what's called Bayes theorem and now i'm too uh, lazy to write this all again so I quickly show you here the Wikipedia page, which calculates exactly this, uh, uh, which calculates exactly uh, this example here by going down here, making this example of a disease which you either have or you don't have. And you have this formula, which always looks a bit intimidating. If it sits here like this or in its complete form, where was it? We here. This is the form how it's usually written, and this looks a bit intimidating, but this is exactly what we've just calculated. Here we have A and B are now our, here we write not A and not B, and I can now write in, uh, copy uh, these things. If I just put the calculations we've done here and put it here, then we recover the formula from Wikipedia, but now it was quite easy to understand what has happened. Now, what does this all have to do with p-values? First of all, nothing, because no p-value appeared. But now, on the second hand, uh, imagine we were now to make a test and we, te we now have a, make a kind of lab test on our mice, like our cancer mice before, a whole experiment. In this experiment, we decide beforehand if my result is above a certain threshold, for example, if more than two, if more than uh, when eight of my 10 mice get cured from cancer, then I will say that my drug is, um, that my drug is, uh, it works. And we can of course put this into this framework that we've used here. So we say um, the drug is, so uh, we would, uh, and our p-value would work as follows now. We take a test, we get a certain result and when we say um, the p-value is 0.05 and as we've said before and if you remember how we defined a p-value it's the following the p-value is the probability to get the test result we have or something even more convincing under the null assumption that there is no disease that's something pretty similar to uh, this thing here the p-value is the probability to get a positive result under the assumption that the patient wasn't even sick. So um, the p-value is something like 1 minus specificity. This 1 minus p-value, because the p-value in a way, uh, because in a way the p-value can be understood as the probability if we now uh, replaced healthy and disease if we now say disease is the drug works and healthy is the drug doesn't work that's a bit turning it around but you know what i mean it's sort of expected versus not when we would say the p-value is uh, in our null hypothesis is that the patient is as much as everybody else namely healthy and the p-value is the probability that even for the patient is healthy we get a positive result which is of course one minus specificity specificity what everybody is interested in is at the end of your data at the end of your life uh, at the end of the thing is you get a result and you want to know what's the probability that i'm right that my drug really works so what you're actually interested is the thing that we want the the opposite probability where we need base theorem to turn it around we have given the probability that the test is positive or negative, given that, uh, that the patient's healthy or deceased, and we want to turn it around uh, such that we know the probability of the, of, the, uh, of the experiment being of a drug working or not, given the result of our experiment. And as we've just seen, we can get this only if we know the prevalence. And the prevalence is quite crucial because imagine the test would be uh, imagine the test would be a much more um, the disease would be quite 
uh, quite common. It would be something like 50%. You can play with this after the lecture and try around a bit how things change. You will notice the rarer the disease is, the bigger the problem becomes. So there's two pieces of information which we had here, which we never have in a, in a typical lab experiment. One is the prevalence, the number of patients who have the disease, or in our case, it would be prob the probability, uh, just without knowing the data, uh, that our experiment works. This probability would be something like, given, so here it is, given 10,000 people, how many of them actually have the disease, in our case, it would be given 10,000 scientists who all work on a hypothesis, how, which percentage of them actually works on a correct hypothesis, and which of them are chasing a, a red duck. Of course, obviously, this is a value which is hard to get by. People have made some, uh, people have turned this around and made uh, and tried to estimate from the number of bad, barely significant p-values that, uh, that are reported in the literature. Uh, we try to estimate how many, uh, how lucky scientists are actually in choosing the hypothesis. Uh, the other number which we have here and which we never have is the specificity, is the sensitivity. You see here, my p-value is one minus specificity, but the other thing that I need is the sensitivity. What is sensitivity? Sensitivity is a number which we can have in a test. A sensitivity tells us the probability to get beyond our p-value threshold of 5% or whatever we choose, given that the, that the data is true. And the sensitivity, of course, depends on how strong your effect is. The stronger the effect, uh, the easier it is to get beyond your p-value threshold. So this is what you look at if you do power analysis. But the thing which you never have in experiment is this baseline probability, which corresponds to abundant uh, to prevalence and that is why we have to work with a p-value why we cannot simply uh, calculate what is the probability that this result is true the only thing that people can give you is the probability that the result that you get this result assuming that it isn't true and it helps a lot to think a bit about this disease case to understand why the p-value is so complicatedly uh, uh, defined as we now have it so that was the part uh, that I wanted to go through with this. Further questions about that? So we still have 10 minutes because we started five minutes late. What I will use them for is um, the following. Uh, is the following. We have, um, I wanted to show you so something completely different and that's a bit I only will start with it now, but then you can already see what we need next time. Let's imagine you get data like this here. Mm, let's see. Now, where is it? W repos uh, data analysis course. Tobias. Tobias is Tobias Reuter, a postdoc or medical doctor in the group of Sascha Dietrich at MMPU who was so nice to share a bit of example data with me. And what they are doing is they like to look at uh, leukemia data. And they, tell, they want to know, they want to understand differences in patients' response to anti-cancer drugs. And you might know some, this is usually uh, the response rate is pretty bad in cancer treatment. Maybe you have a drug which helps 60% or 30% or 20% of the patients. You want to study this, but it's hard to give uh, to try around and, and give one and the same patient 20 different drugs. And so it's hard to understand if this drug doesn't work, which other drugs works. Uh, the next best thing that you can do is do it in vitro. You take uh, tumor samples from the patients, treat these tumor samples in vitro with a whole panel of different drugs and look at the differences to try to understand why some, to see how this correlates. Whether, whether, cert, whether you can say whenever this drug doesn't work, the other drug probably also doesn't work in vitro. So maybe this is an interesting in vivo thing. So what they did is they took here for this small, very simple example, I asked them to give me the data from his most primitive experiment that he's ever done. Usually they are much bigger scale. And what he did is he had a um, drug plate. Now this car 
Yes, I don't need the re He had data from 20, he made a prepared a master drug plate, which looks like this. Uh, now let's go to the top. You have here your 96 well from A1 to H16 or whatever it is. Here is the name of the drug always. And here is the drug concentration in micromole. And the other thing that we have and uh, that, for, that they then copied with a pipetting robot with master plate, which had 20 different drugs, each in five different concentration in the various well of these things. And they took the whole thing and copied it over on a plate, which was filled with, uh, with um, white blood cells from one of these patients. So we're talking about, look, about lymphomas here. So this was some white blood cells from these lymphomas. And when you put it in the plate reader, and those of you who have worked with it might know what the plate reader then gives you is something which looks like this. You get this lengthy table, which has all kinds of stuff. And the only thing we actually care about is this part here in the middle, which tells you, uh, which tells you what the intensities are about how alive the cells are. So these numbers were fluorescent readouts of some uh, metabolic assay. I think it was cell titer glow, which measures the concentration, lyses the cells, and then measures the concentration of ATP. Uh, to see how many of the cells were alive. And what we now want to do is we want to somehow get this table into R and we want to then uh, bring this alongside with this other table here, which has all the drugs. And how would we do that? So let's see how far we got in our remaining five minutes. Just so that all of you remember what we talked about the first time and feel now motivated to look it up again before the next lecture, we had this thing, the uh, tidyverse, which remember was this uh, refined command of R things. Now I set my working directory to the directory where I have all this data. And what I now have prepared for you here is this lengthy thing, which missing <coughs> column X1. This is not nice. Uh, Miss oh no, which uh, now produces me this nice plate data. Here you see the intensity and you chose me automatically where on the plate for the first patients I had high in fluorescence intensity and where I had low intensity. If I now know my plate, I can immediately check whether these were really the, uh, the positive control plates where I put the extra, uh, uh, extra strong uh, drugs. How can I so easily get from this to this? Let's see. You remember what I told you a while ago, if you get such an R code like this and you want to know what it does, it pays to do it step by step. So the first thing what we have here is the name of one of these CSV files. That was th this file here. And I wanted to read it in. And my first problem was that uh, when I simply read it in with something like read CSV, uh, when it happily reads this in and tells you, you have a, ta a table with only one column because it says this is the column and this is the rest. So I first need to tell it, ignore the first five lines. So I have here skip equals five, and I don't want to read it in, it to read in all this chunk at the end. So I tell it to read at most 16 lines. And if it ignores the first five lines and then takes 16 lines, it just gets this thing. So let's see how this works. If I do this here, then you see it actually works nicely. I get one table here which has a first column, which is simply called X1 because it didn't have a name and one, one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, uh, all the way to 24 and it goes down here from A to P. The next thing and that's something we, is now that I want to bring it from a wide form into a long form. Uh, what this means is maybe easier if I just demonstrate it. I execute the second file. Now I have what we call a long form. In the long form, I just have, instead of one white column, I just have three values, row, column, and intensity. The long form, or as Hadley, Hadley Wickham, who is an opinionated guy, so the guy who, in, who made the tidyverse, he's an opinionated guy, he prefers to call them a uh, messy table and tidy table. He says, this is messy, it's biologists. This is tidy, that's data scientist. Why does uh, Hadley pre consider this tidy? Because it just puts one piece of data in each row. So Hadley's rule for tidy data is only one data per row. This is messy because it has so many different data in the same row. 
And in order to tidy up our data, we need the gather command. The gather command, uh, what does it do? Remember again, it uh, it gathers first. Uh, it um, it gathers all columns except for the first column, which is labeled x1 for some reason. So minus x1 means everything before the first one. That should be gathered, and it should be gathered and changed into two columns. The first to be called column, and the second intensity. This is now a bit hard to explain for me because I say I have a column called column, but you know I was, when I say column, I either mean column in my table or column on the plate. So here, this is the plate column. Maybe I should call it here plate column. So, uh, so I gather these things, and what I had before here in the, and when I gather all these columns, I have two things. I have a header of a column, one, two, three, four, five, and I have the actual values. And these should become two columns. One column, the first one, contains all this header and keeps repeating it for each row, and the other one has these values. So to turn this white table into this long table, what I need to do is I need to tell R which columns it should gather, namely everything with intensity values. That's everything except for the first one. That's what here in the gather command. I have to tell, and I have to tell it how it should call the two columns. It ha I have to tell it how should it call the column which contains what used to be the color header, and the column which used to be the column values. And the first column I call plate column, and the second I call intensity. I explain this at length because uh, every time you have to do this yourself, it's a bit hard to wrap your head around about what you have to do in gather. You, if you use the gather command, you also have to remember, I want to create two columns. One column contains the, what used to be the headers. The second column will contain the actual values. I first have to give the name of a new column for the headers, then the name of a new column for the actual values, and then what columns I want to gather. And once I've done this, I now have this kind of things. And now it's much easier to work with this. The first thing I do is tidy things up a bit more. Now this thing is called plate column, and this should be called plate row. So I say rename this x1 to row. Let's do this. Stop. So, and you see now it's called row. What's the next thing? Uh, this thing here, you see, this is here a character, and this here is called a character vector, but maybe it would be better to explain it that it's an integer vector. We don't quite need this. Uh, and I just do it. Then here, I reverse the order of the row columns. I, instead of explaining what these two do, I just show you what happens if I don't have them. Right. This is if I don't have them. What I now uh, do, I take this, row, this column as we do and give it to ggplot. And if you, and you see, I still get my plate plot. What's wrong with this plate plot, you'll see in a moment. Let's first tell you what's right. I have here my geomtile command. Geomtile is to make this kind of heat maps where I describe each tile, each individual square. And in order to describe this tile, I have to say where it should be and which <coughs> color it should have. The x-axis should be the plate column. The y-axis should be the plate row. So that my whole heat map shows the plate in its layout. And the intensity and the intensity value should be filled. So here I have my three column names, the row, column, intensity. And this column should tell the, the x-axis in the heat map, with the y-axis, and with the intensity. And I use this as a color. So ggplot automatically makes this nice intensity thing here, which shows us how the intensity grows. What's wrong with this heat map? Can anybody spot it? The Both the order of the rows and of the columns is wrong. The A to a P goes from bottom to top, but even I as a dry lab person who has never hand P stand stood in a lab know that in a 96 well plate, the top row is A and the bottom row is P. So I have to tell R to reverse the row labels. And that's what you do with this factor reverse function, which just, I now don't explain the detail why it's called factor reverse, but you can guess that the reverse means uh, put them in the other order. Now A is on top. What other thing has happened uh, for the columns, we also haven't told it the order. On the first hand, you should say this time the order should be obvious. One, two, three, four, five. Luckily for us, it has ordered it alphabetically. 
And in a computer's alphabet, there's also numbers besides letters, and one becomes for two. So 1, 10, 12, 19, 2, 20, and so on. How do we fix that? We tell our that these are not strings to be ordered alphabetically, but numbers to be ordered numerically. So I say here S integer or S numeric. You can use both. And then with this, we get now our nice heat map, like that. And I can quickly make the heat map maybe go here for E in one two five. And now I have here, um, let's call it name equals S print F. This is just a way to construct a name quickly. I say here, use, use this, uh, replace this percent D with I. I don't explain the details now. I only quickly want to show what we get this way. Now it has produced us five plots. Maybe I should here add plus GG title and name. Run this once more. And now you haven't seen the five plots, but they should be here. Sorry. Uh, okay. This is also something I have to explain next time why there is a print statement. But if I do this, then it prints us five plots here, patient five, patient four, patient three, patient two, patient one. They all look the same. What have I done wrong? Of course, I haven't replaced here the word patient one by the name variable that I've just constructed. This already is a pretty neat thing because I can also put a PDF command around that and then it writes this not on the screen but makes a PDF with five pages. And if I'm now as a bioinformatician, I ha if I now get a screen and I want to get a first overview of my screen just to see whether everything is right, this is quite neat to be able to look at the plots, scroll through them, see, aha, uh -huh, down there, there's always nothing. Is this, bro is, is this broken there or is this where I put my negative control? Uh, here is a nice drug which always increases in concentration and hence in, in, in lethality. You see, when if you keep looking at this thing, you see how it comes up. In this patient, it didn't have an effect. So this way you can already see, maybe it's all bright or it's all black. You can already see whether the illumination was right, whether your fluorescent scanner worked and so on. Now the next thing is, of course, at the moment these are just dots. We would like to see, uh, we would like to see, um, uh, as drug names or something like this, maybe get to get to things like uh, like um, li something like drug response uh, uh, plots, where we see how a drug changes its response, uh, how uh, the response to a drug changes with concentration, and when we have a plot with such curves for each of the five patients in one plot. And that's what we'll try next time. Okay, so I think with this thing we are through. Uh, right, I wanted to hands through an attendance list. But you have one. Has everybody written on that, even both? Who, because I want to explain this, we have a. Uh, those people I've been now explained, or probably you all know, who want uh, some kind of certificate for their ECDS points should please sign on these attendance sheets. But actually, at least once or twice, I would ask everybody to sign because for the uh, for uh, funding and reports and so on, it would be good to have something like that. <laughs> Oh, four, six, seven, yeah, this is good.